Welcome to this Parallax podcast. My name is Tom Amark. I'm your host. Today, uh, my guests are Thomas Bjorkman and John Bunsell. John Bunsell is a, I hope I get that right, a businessman, an author, and the founder of um, The Simple Campaign, to, to put it shortly. Uh, Thomas Bjorkman is also an entrepreneur with a background in physics, also a book author, and uh, the founder, I could say, of a couple of foundations, the Co-Creation Loft, for example, in um, Germany and Berlin. Thank you both for coming to this podcast. Thank you. Um, um, we, we both did a um, couple of lectures for Parallax, and I invite every reader, uh, every listener to, to check them out to get more deeply into your ways of thinking. I just had the ideas to bring you both to the table to talk about, well, world-centric ways of coding, you know, new ways of, of global governance, uh, conscious, uh, evolution of consciousness and culture. And um, yeah, and I, I would just, you know, we were just starting before a little bit of that. John, could you, you know, you, you were mentioning and. Uh, two concepts nation state thinking and, and conscious evolution and you know working from from your simple approach could you could you elaborate a little bit on on what you're trying to do yeah uh, yeah um so really i think the first thing is to try to wake wake people up to the the power or the influence that that the nation state has on our thinking to the point where we, we, we just don't even realize it. You know, we, you know we, we think through and we look through national glasses and um, we don't re we're not really conscious of how powerful that is on us. And, and that, that, to my mind, has, a, has an enormous um, effect on, on moving up to this sort of a more world-centric level of consciousness. Um, <clears throat> you, you mentioned before that we were starting at in in the evolution of humanity at even smaller groups and um, Lena and myself in our book the Nordic secret we are talking about the expanding circles of belonging that there is a natural expansion there so the nation state has been with us and very strongly with us right now but it's a relatively recent concept so if you if you go back and elab elaborate on the previous sort of circles of belonging or yes. whatever we would call that, yeah. So 14 billion years ago, Thomas, <laughs> there was the, the big bangs and we were really tightly together then. <laughs> that was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but uh, seriously, um, uh, I suppose, you know, if you, you, can, you can follow it all the way from, from atoms uh, up to, to uh, molecules, to, to cells, uh, to multi-celled organisms, uh, you know, each of these levels was in a sense a, a cooperative level of governance or, a co you know, a co cooperative, uh, you know, you could say, if you like, that the, that the glue that holds uh, a cell together or that holds a multi-celled organism together or our human body, the glue is, is in a sense governance in that sense. I use it in that sort of looser sense rather than in the sense of a, you know, how we, how we again imagine. In fact, you know, the way we imagine governance is nation centric. You know, so if I talk to people about global cooperative governance, they immediately imagine a world government on the model of their national government. Mm -hmm. That's nation centrism. So yeah. they pro we project our national concepts up to to the global level and of course then everybody freaks out and says oh no we don't want to do that and i agree with them of course we don't want to do that um but anyway that's 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 what i mean by governance and and, and so evolution has progressed to ever larger scales of cooperation because group selection theory which um, i mean you know for example david sloan wilson and other evolutionary biologists you know the idea is is that <clears throat> is that uh uh, individuals within a group will, will, will uh, you know, their self-interest will undermine cooperation. But cooperative groups are more competitive against other groups, right? Yes. So that, that sort of process leads to ever larger scales, you know, groups combining to, 
you know, if two tribes were warring with each other, if another tribe came over the hill uh, to threaten them, they both would get together to make a bigger unit, you know, and this has just gone on yeah. and on. And so, so group selection theory and, and natural selection has favored ever larger cooperative governance units. But when you get to the global level, there is no outer threat. You know, there are no aliens from outer space to galvanize humanity to, to cooperate into one unit. And, and this is why um, evolutionary biologists like, like John Stewart say that evolution itself has to go up now to, to conscious or, or you know, culturally conscious evolution, whereby, and what that effectively means is that cooperation on the, on the level of the globe won't happen by itself. It has to be consciously, intentionally planned. And to me, that means that we need, we need a plan. You know, we need something like simple, you know, and, and preferably other plans too. But, but um, it is clear that evolution, want, you know, where evolution wants to go is towards some form of global cooperative governance. And I think that is in any case obvious from things like coronavirus and climate change. And yeah, because that's really my, my, my comment and my question there, that I, I certainly agree with your description there. there, there has been a direction of the evolution ever, ever since Big Bang and certainly since uh, the inception of hum humanity and human culture, we have been moving towards larger and larger groups of coordination, larger, higher and higher complexity in our, in our systems. But just because hum uh, evolution wants us to move in that direction, we as self-conscious humans, we do not necessarily need to go in that direction. So I think a question that we should ask ourselves, even if the answer is yes, I believe, do we want to go in the direction of evolution? Is that in the interest of humanity to go in the direction of, of evolution? Or is, or is that inevitable? Or might it be, as you suggest, it's not inevitable, but we actually want to help evolution to take this next step. So if we, if we leave the naturalistic framework for a minute and take on moral framework, where, where would we want to go as humanity if we were free to choose? Well, I think, I think we, would, we, would want to, we would want to survive as we always have. And if we want to survive, I think it seems to me that we would want to cooperate at the global level in order to deal with these global threats that are are, are, are increasingly set to wipe us out or to at least if not wipe us out then cause well some of them like nuclear weapons that could wipe us out mm. um, you know so so it seems to me that we would want to go in that direction anyway if we were sim sufficiently conscious to see to understand you know to put down our nation-centric glasses put on the world-centric glasses and be able to see that that's where our best interests lie. But the question is, if I, if I may, if I may, I'm I just like I just say that I agree. I just want to say that uh, that, that that I agree uh, with that, and that makes your argument even stronger. That yes, we are on an evolutionary trajectory in in a direction, and that is actually where we want to go and where we need to go, because with the technological evolution that we have had during the last couple of hundred years, we are now at a scale where the globe has shrunk and become so small that most problem, coronavirus, environmental problems, even political governance problems are now global problems and we need to deal with them. Sorry, Tom. Yeah. No, no, but I was just wondering if those are not two separate things in a kind of way, because, you know, as a, as a, as humankind, we are already in a kind of survival mode, you know, like, regarding climate change and regarding COVID. But on the other side, this lingers the question if we want to be conscious and actors of evolutionary principles. And so like, so where, you know, aren't these two different things? Or where do they overlap in a kind of way? Because, you know, to, to, so to, to want to be in that kind of survival stage doesn't necessarily mean we have to be, you know, um, we have to be world centric, you know? because we can just rely on our instincts maybe to, 
to, to, to survive. So where does this overlap? Uh, I, I think we st staying in this evolutionarily naturalistic perspective a little bit longer uh, for a while at least um, our instincts are very good and very strong and, and sometimes we can really trust them but we should remember that these instincts uh, evolved during a very different uh, uh, in a very different environment most of our instincts we, we even share with the animals but certainly most of our human instincts were developed in an evolutionary environment around a million years ago, up till perhaps a couple of hundred thousand years ago, where we were essentially living stone age life in small hunter-gatherer societies. And uh, that is of course why some of our instincts, for example, the instinct of xenophobia was probably had probably survival value back then, but is something that we need to consciously overcome uh, today. Whereas right. other instincts are serving us equally well today, of course. Yes, that's that's right, and I I, I completely agree with that. But I, but I think also, um, Tom, it, it's a question of it's not that everybody needs to be world centric. You know, it's that 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 critical number of pe a critical. 10% or whatever the, the tipping point is need to be not only world centric. Um, <laughs> well, I, <laughs> my frustrations at the integral community are going to come out now, um, but um, you know, not only world centric, but politically and civically world centric, not right. just world centric on our meditation mats, but, but uh, you know, uh, in, a, in, a, in a much more active political, civic political, sense hmm. um, so uh, i think so it's not that everybody needs to be world centric that that's that, that just ain't going to happen right but, but, but we do need mechanism that that is where i think that simple is is one very good uh, initiative in that direction that we do need mechanism that can help us as humanity to coordinate some of our actions on a global scale so some of our problems, like, for example, the environmental uh, problems, they are only solvable on um, a global scale, whereas many other problems and opportunities should, of course, be, be solved or realized on, on a local basis, perhaps even more local than today, where we, again, with the, with the nation state glasses, as you say, John, we, we tend to see most problems on that level, even if they could and perhaps even should be solved on, on a small scale level, on a, on a regional level, on a communal level, or, or even a problem that we might even be able to solve in, in just in the block where I live, but, but we <laughs> don't have that, those powers delegated to us today, so to say. No, so I, I think, think, that, it's, I think it's, that's it's, right. It's to be, to be able to, to really play yeah. the whole spectrum and, yeah. and to see, yes, what can be solved on the local level, we sh should solve on the local level. We, we do not need to have one homogeneous world culture and we should do everything the same everywhere in the world. Absolutely not. But we do need some sort of minimum common language so that we can have a common sense-making and decision process for those questions that can only, again, be solved or, or governed on a global basis. Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, in, 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 uh, in the simple solution, Thomas, if you look at that, I, I lay out very, we lay out very clearly where, where that borderline is between, you know, global and what is national and so forth. So there is that subsidiarity principle is, is very strongly built in uh, to simple. I mean, just a couple of things I would say also is that I think one of the, the potentially valuable things about Simpol is that if we, it gives us um, a practice, you know, thinking about global cooperation is one thing, but you, without a praxis, without a practice, because I think for many people, the, the, the practice will lead Will, will be the leading thing. It, you know, they might, they won't think it through and then say, oh yes, I'll support Simpol. For some people, 
if the you know if the, the campaign gets going they'll just follow the practice and suddenly discover oh it works you know and that will educate them the educational process will be the other way around um but um um i've forgotten the other thing i was going to say but never mind carry on carry on so, so, I, so i would be interested to to um, hear your thoughts there john on this process as we are expanding our, our circles and we need to at least in some aspects be able to hold the whole global complexity in in, in not just our minds but also in our, our our hearts and perhaps it's holding it in our hearts that seems to be the most difficult part of it how do you see this in relationship to what i'm uh, often talking about as our individual and collective, but perhaps first our individual ability to throughout life develop and, and deepen our consciousness, deepen our awareness, and that our minds are actually uh, also uh, under evolution during our lifetime, and that we might need to support uh, higher levels of evolution of our mind and consciousness just in order to be able to actually take these problems to our minds and to our hearts. Definitely. I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 um, the, uh, what was it called? The Bildung that you yeah. were talking about in the Nordic secret, this, <clears throat> this idea of almost, you could say like consciousness boot camps, <laughs> putting it putting it a bit crudely um mm. or training centers or or uh, colleges schools or whatever you want to call them institutes i think that that is very necessary uh and um because i think also that especially at this stage in the development of of integral or metamodernism or whatever you want to call it <clears throat> there are not many of us up here you know, and therefore it's important that, that we have organizations that bring us together and that, um, and that um, you know, develop that, that consciousness and that, that uh, you know, exactly what you're talking about. I think. Yeah, and I, I think we are in one of these um, big societal transitions again like the one when we went from a medieval pre-modern way of seeing the world and relating in the world into modernity when we went from being uh, agricultural feudal societies into being modern democratic industrial nations and that's also when we put on the the glasses of the nation state as you as you were men mentioning I think that we are in an equally deep transition now into uh, a new type of society that will also entail us putting on new glasses that will not just be removing the nation state lens, but also complementing many of these lenses that we, that we developed during the enlightenment, sort of the, the rationalist, the, the overbelief in the supremacy of the rationalistic scientific uh, approach to to knowledge and to complement that with also other ways to understand the world and uh, yeah to interpret the world yes for sure for sure um, well, let me Maya, uh, ask something because you you mentioned conscious evolution and and you were talking about uh, uh, nation state and modernity and 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 capitalism and you know if if you look at those developmental models they all came up at the same time like our understanding of the nation state and our understanding of democracy and 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 on modernity in a way and and so this this German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk he he observes he he looks at those systems as as training systems we developed he calls them uh, anthropod techniques so we we learn how to interact in proper ways with other people through capitalism and through trade and so and 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 educate us even more and you know and i think like the the you know it's a, such a uh fascinating and powerful system capitalism or, or, or the nation state because it 
it and and that was the reason why I mentioned it because it, it it taps into our instincts, you know, and 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 it taps in our way to to compete and to strive and to do something in the world and and so. But how how you know would be uh, what would be like the the conscious approach to all of that? That because we we can be clear about that that we can't just abolish capitalism. You know, if we put capitalism aside, our society would be way worse, I think. So like, how do we integrate, uh, you know, these kinds of uh, systems and training systems and develop a more more conscious culture in a way, you know, how, what, what would be a proper way for, for a conscious capitalism? Like not, not just on the, you know, cultural level, but also on the individual level, like in terms of conscious evolution. You, you know where I'm getting at? You understand what I mean? Yeah, I, th I think I, I, I think, think so. I, I could. I, th I think I could go there. Um, I think that the uh, awakening of this evolution that John was referring to—that we are starting to become self-aware that we are on a journey, both as individuals but also as societies, on an evolutionary journey—that awakening also awakens us to the fact that we start to see the societal structures and societal culture and all those socially constructed aspects of our world that if we go really deep, some uh, sociologists would call that our collective imaginary. All those things that we have invented as humanity, but we believe in them collectively, even though they are just inventions, but we believe in them because they make our world function. And one such uh, belief, one collective imaginary, is of course the nation state. There is nothing natural around nation states. It's just something that we, that we have invented and that we believe in. And another aspect of this uh, collective imaginary is of course the market and the economic system. So it's very important to point out that the economic system today and the market uh, is not a natural system. It is a human invention and even the free market, if there would be such a thing, could look very, very different. Um, and, a, and a good example, just to, to understand what I'm, what I'm talking about here, is of course just to look at things like, what can we own? And uh, go, going back to, to Stone Age, of course there is some sort of original concept of ownership. I own my stone tool because I have possession of it. But that type of ownership is just a fraction of what we are talking about today. So 80% of all world trade is actually around immaterial property rights. It's like patents and copyrights and things like that. And then of course you need to ask yourself, what should it be possible to patent? Should we be able to own ideas? Should we be able to own human genes? If somebody claims ownership of a particular human, human gene, gene, how long should such an ownership be valid for? Uh, in perpetuity or 50 years or 20 years? And of course, those decisions will hugely infect the way the market will clear. It will infect who will be winners in this particular form of the market and who, who will be the losers. So I, I would say that the first thing to answer your question is just to start to become aware of the fact that the economic system and, and the market and even money is just a human invention and that we collectively could decide that they should function differently. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's, that's absolutely right, Thomas. I think though that what we need to understand is why the collective imaginary of the nation state uh, or as, as the container for, for capitalism and the market um, is no longer functioning. You know, it's functioned quite well up until, I don't know, the, the, you know, the, the 1970s, 80s, the, the, before globalization kicked in. But I think what, what people need to understand is that, <clears throat> is that uh, the reason that it is Dis the, the collective imaginary is, is disintegrating is because capitalism and the market has actually outgrown the uh, ambit, the, the container of the nation state and is now moving freely and globally. 
and yeah. that that is actually now undermining the nation state. Yes. Uh, because yeah. you know the owners of of property rights can can turn around to one government and say, well, look, if you if you don't uh, give me the right uh, legal framework or support. Uh, I'll go and take my invention somewhere else, or I'll go st set up my business somewhere else. But and then, so, if, I, if, I, if I could then play just the devil's advocate in this case and say, yeah, you say that in, in the 70s, in the, in the 80s, when globalization kicked in, then we had an undermining, if that had an undermining effect on the nation state. And I totally agree. But then when you say globalization kicked in, if I'm the devil's advocate, I could say, well, that's exactly the problem. So we should get rid of globalization and save the nation state. And we should give the power back to the nation state. The problem is the globalization. Let's get rid of that. And why is this a false argument? <laughs> Is that, is that what you're is that what you're proposing or what? No, no, but that as a devil's advocate. I mean, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, as a as a as a devil's advocate, you you could say that the problem is globalization. Let's get yeah, rid I of. I think that would be Douglas Murray's yeah. argument, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah sort exactly. of, yes, it would be exactly. the argument of some people on the right. No, yeah, or even Brexit. Even well, Brexit. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's that, that's right. Even um, Brexit. So so why is that not a valid argument? We have to. Well, one we one because it one because it simply won't happen. Um, because globalization is, has gone too far for that to that to happen, um, <clears throat> and you know you've only got to to look at your your phone or or any uh, sort of fairly sophisticated consumer item, which is probably made of components that come from I don't know fifty different countries or something, um, to see that um, you know it, we 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 are irrevocably in a globalized world, mm -hmm. and whether and also Thomas whether we go back to even if we did go back to nation states, climate change would still be there. Mm, yeah, Global yeah, pandemics yeah. would still be there. Yeah, all yeah. of these, all of these problems would still be there. So I think the, the, the key, the key solution is, you know, the market has gone to the global level already. We need to bring governance up to the same level mm. so that again, the market is, is contained again within some form of cooperative global governance in the, you know, again, I stress not a world government, but something more along the lines of Simpol, I would suggest, or something which is um, a lot more like a global treaty, um, but with, you know, very specific, um, specifically designed so that what a nation loses on one issue, it can gain on another issue. And um, <clears throat> so that every nation knows what every other nation is going to be doing. And, and, and you know a much deeper level of co coordination and cooperation, okay. but not a world government. Yeah. So, so my my uh, my answer to to the devil's advocate w would be something along your lines. Absolutely, that uh, globalization is because of technical um, evolution, the, the evolution of technology, uh, but but also from uh, uh, the environmental aspect. That, that we need to have global coordination now, that we, we don't have a choice there. But I would also recognize that there is some truth to, to, to the devil uh, and his arguments, and, and, and that is that the way we implemented globalization in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, and the way that we implemented the global market back then and today, that was not inevitable. That, that was a choice that was made bearing in mind a very specific and I would say dated economic theory and that is the neoliberal economic theory and the way that we implemented globalization that served mainly the interest of global capital and it did not take into account the interest of, of ordinary citizens. I think those who implemented this knew that, but everyone thought, or at least they tried to persuade themselves with a neoliberal economic argument that, okay, it will be a hard time for a couple of decades, but then the market will lift everyone. But that didn't happen. And a new economic theory shows that that will never happen. So, so I think that what we need to do is to recognize, yes, this is inevitable, but we have a possibility to manage the process 
and that the process has to a large extent been mismanaged. And I would argue that both Brexit and Trump are results of that mismanagement of that, of that process. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I mean, I would say unmanaged, really, Thomas, because I think yeah. that, you know, the point is, is that, you know, the global market and global capital is effectively unmanageable by any governance institution. You know, even the IMF uh, and the World Bank, they don't really manage global markets. They just react to them as best as they can. You know, so so I think whatever the situation, it seems to me... Both yes, and, both yes and no. I mean, a practical example. I mean, one problem with the global markets is that we allow the big corporations, whether they are Starbucks, so as an example in, from the UK, or if it's Google or Facebook, to, to actually be taxed on where profits are not only not just not generated but where profits are booked which means that you can move the profits wherever you want and you can have have the competition between various tax jurisdictions if we were instead to rely more heavily not on a corporate tax on profit but on a turnover tax and that that turnover would be tied to the geographical area where the turnover is generated, then you would have a completely different control over the international capital. But that is not in the interest of capital. And, mm -hmm. and capital controls Washington, and Washington controls the World Trade Organization. So, But I mean, yeah, okay. But I mean, either way, if, if one is going to change that system, or if one is going to, to, to go move away from... Um, taxing profits, you know, where they're booked to, to turn a turnover tax, that too, I would think, would have to be agreed globally, I would imagine, more or less. Yeah, yeah well, well, of course, EU could decide, or UK after Brexit could decide that, but of course, that would upset people, and that yeah. might upset USA, and perhaps EU or, Brit or Britain does not want to upset the USA to, to that extent, you know? Yeah, well, this, this is it. I mean, there's a competitive... But that's element. your basic point, John, yeah. isn't it? It's, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, 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 and so, so you I need think, to do you it know... simultaneously. You need to do it simultaneously. And that's why we have simple. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, I, you know, I suppose what I'm saying is whichever way you dice or slice it, it, you know, it comes back to the same issue. At the end of the day, we've already got a global economy, whether we like it or not. And, um, you know, we have to bring governance up to the same level. Otherwise, we are, you know, evolution is going to go in the opposite direction and take us into regression and chaos and, yeah. and down, yeah. down, yeah. down again. Yeah. Um, but I think the, um, just coming back, I remember now your other point, Thomas, was about, you know, subsidiarity and doing things as locally as possible. And I think, I think the other part of a world-centric um, understanding is that, I mean, just, just to give an example, if, if we had um, <clears throat> governance, uh, cooperative governance or SIMPOL at the global level, whereby we said, for example, just crudely, uh, if we were to say, well, now we can tax long-distance transportation globally and simultaneously, the effect would be that local production and consumption would become much more competitive everywhere. So, so what I'm trying to say is there's a synergy between global action and local health. And, and then to, to say nothing, there would be less transportation, less emissions, less asthma, less people coughing like me, mm -hmm. you know, and all the health benefits that, that would trickle down from that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I think that, you know, that there, there is a, there is a, it's not, it's not think globally, act locally. To my mind, that is a, a green level misunderstanding. It's got to be act, think and act globally and locally too. You know, the, the two are, are to, it's a both and. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. And, 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 and I think the, you know, the, the, the absence of that governance at the global level is what is driving, as you say, uh, you know, Brexit and Trump, you know, this win-lose imbalance uh, of, 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 a, of, a, of an economy absent of a governance on the same scale means that you have a very win-lose situation. People then from poor countries feel forced to move to the richer countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then, of course, there's a backlash against that immigration. 
uh, and, uh, and then you get Brexit and Trump and the rise of the far right. And that's why we're seeing that not just in this or that country, but all over the West, mm-hmm. if, not for, if not beyond. Mm-hmm. So, so I think that there is an argument, there is an argument for people on the right, if you like, to have some form of global cooperation too. Because if we can then uh, tax the multinational, you know, the, the Amazons and the Googles properly, we can redistribute that wealth more evenly across borders to poorer countries so that pe- people can much more easily make a decent living in, in their home country. Mm. I mean, I know that's easier said than done, but it seems to me that ultimately that's the only way to really protect national cultural identities everywhere. You yeah. know, rather yeah. than this kind of pu- people pumping pumped by the uneven system from, from the south to the north. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. So, but what does so it mean in terms for the for the individual? You know, because you know an individual can hardly act on a global level. You know, it's like in certain well, circumstances, they, probably, they but normally, simple, hmm? Tom. what they can with simple. Right. Right. Okay. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah. I mean, we we have had instances where just one person has joined a campaign in in a particular electoral area. We've told the member of parliament. And the member of parliament has signed up. So in, in some cases, just one person right. uh, has been, you know, can, can actually start to move the political process a little, a little bit, you know. Right. But imagine what we could do, you know, if we had a few a few hundred thousand. Just just finishing that on our discussion around the nation state and uh, the um the uh, the market, and I would also add democracy to, to this. Um, um, discussion and, and again recognizing that both the nation state, the market in its present implementa- implementation and democracy in its present implementation are social constructs and they, they could be different. Uh, I totally agree with what you said that, that the nation state has due to uh, technological evolution and other factors a, a little bit lost its efficiency as, as a governance structure. I would argue exactly the same for the market, that uh, the market is super efficient, of course, in many respects, but in perhaps one of the most important respects, and that is in managing uh, the, the environmental um, uh, problems, there the market is completely inefficient. And that, and, and that di- didn't matter perhaps so much 100 years ago, but today it's crucial. So, I mean, the evolution has also outgrown the, the market in its present implementation. I still hope that we will have the market around in 50 years, but in, in, a, in a little bit different implementation. And the same, I hope, about democracy, that yeah. we will still have democracy around uh, in 50 years, but, in, but that will have by necessity to be in a different implementation. Because what I think we see right now, both in the US and in Europe and in other places, is that the evolution has overtaken these present uh, implementations or interpretations of the concept of democracy. And we need to reinvent. Yeah, I mean, that, that's another aspect. I think that's, that's been another, to my mind, another consequence of, of globalization and markets having outgrown the the governance container of the nation state, because as soon as capital is global and governance is only national, the logical consequence is that you know, every government needs inward investment for, to, to bring jobs and prosperity and, and a growing economy. So every government is in competition with every other government to be relatively attractive to global capital. And yeah. that the effect of that, it seems to me, over the since the 1980s, has been a sort of narrowing of the, the parameters of feasible policy. So yeah. you know, you you you, you know, your 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 policy is is fine so long as it keeps the UK internationally competitive, or keeps yeah. Sweden or yeah. Germany or wherever it is internationally yeah. competitive. And that has meant that whoever gets into power, whichever party we elect, has has pretty much ended up doing much the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that's today why people have just grown so fed up with democracy as we have known it. Um, 
and, 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 have, and have, moved, have therefore moved to the extremes because they see the center as just being more of the same uh, uh, schlamuzzle as, as, yeah. as for the last, you know, the last 30 decades. So I think globalization has had this, this I call it pseudo-democracy. You know, it's yeah. a, you know, whoever you vote for, the policies get the same. But then the, the break from that, of course, was, was Brexit and Trump, where people just said, enough. Or, or enough people said enough, enough yeah. and you know then you had the the explosion. But again, the the cause comes from the global level. Yeah. You know, the, 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 and and so I think again that democracy needs to, you know, move up to the global level, so that then the national level democracy can can once again become relevant and effective in its in its correct place. If you see what I mean. No, no, no. Uh, 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 absolutely. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Thomas, what do you do uh, with the co-creation loft? I wanted to ask you that because uh, you were just releasing that promo video, you know, like uh, where, where you said that you wanted to, that you're looking for new ways of codes for, you know, global cooperation. So, and, and global co-creation. So like, what, what is it, what you do with your uh, hmm? foundation there? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, I would first then take, take a step back and say that um, after I left the banking industry and I was an investment banker and a serial entrepreneur for 25 years and I left that industry 10 years ago to set up my own foundation in Stockholm, the Oak Island Foundation, and really concentrate on what we are talking about today, the connection between our inner personal development, inner maturation or consciousness development, and societal change, cultural change and societal change, and how these two, two aspects are in constant dialogue with each other. And if we are going to solve the, the problems that we are facing in the world, we cannot just look at one aspect. We have to look at them in, in tandem. So I'm, I'm doing that from a, from a theoretical perspective and I'm writing books, but also from a very practical perspective. So for example, at our island outside Stockholm that the, my foundation owns and manage, we have during the summer youth camps for adolescents where we explore these questions of what, what it means to be human in this complex world today. But then also practical um, projects like how do we live together in a more conscious way and how can we have communities that can live together and support each other in this inner developmental journey that we are all on. So that was the starting point for our, what we sometimes call our conscious co-living space in Stockholm, where we have 55 uh, uh, people, mostly entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs, but also artists and uh, other people living together, coming from about 20 different nations, supporting each other in their inner developmental journey. Uh, in the same way, the co-creation loft in Berlin and the air credit cluster in Stockholm are conscious co-working spaces where we are experimenting uh, with how, how can we work, to work together in more conscious ways and how can we all support each other in the exploration of both our personal inner development, but also in the development of organizations and ways of working. Can we get these interesting ideas of self-organization? Can we implement self-organizing projects, self-organizing uh, uh, corporations? Could we even do politics in a self-organizing way? So you could see both the co-creation loft and the clustered in Stockholm as small experiments of what I hope could be something that could be scaled in, in the future uh, and would be examples of how we organize and live and work together in the future. Right. I so, also, when, when I'm advertising my projects, I also need to advertise my projects at 29K, which is a digital platform that uh, my foundation is developing together with another foundation in Stockholm, the... Uh, Norfrian Foundation, which is a technology for the common good foundation. We are, we are developing a uh, digital platform to try to democratize this with inner development. And John was mentioning these retreat centers and 
personal development uh, efforts that were done in Scandinavia over a hundred years ago. Uh, I think that we can use uh, the, the digital uh, as a way of scaling those initiatives uh, to the scale that we that we need today, and we need this in a in a huge scale. And as we said before, at least 10, 15, 20 percent of of us all need to start to see the world in more depth and nuances, more complexity. Leave this black and white, right and wrong, us and them thinking, and, right. and really be able to embrace the, the the complexity of our of our global world. So that is 29k. I mean, it's a little bit off topic, but you know, I I, I had published the book also from David Corton. You know the Club of Rome member. You are also connected to the Club yes. of Rome, right? Yes, I, I, I am a member of the. Club yes, of Rome. yes, exactly. And so this book changed the story, changed the uh, changed. What what was the original title? Let me just have a look. Um, changed the stories, uh, changed the future. And so he had a very, very integral approach to you know the way we we tell about the story. You know what what kind of stories we tell the world as a, a machine, say as a modern modernistic narrative, and and so like. That now, how much like that, you know, uh, a, a, a person so old and imminent in a kind of way as a as a member of a club of Rome has such an integral approach to all of that. It is, isn't that a good sign that there's like lots of movement, lots of nuanced thinking going on? And and you know, what is the club of Rome doing? You know, from from your point of view right now, like to to solve all these issues. No, um, very quick answer. I don't want to. Mo mo monopolize the, the no 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 but right you know. right now but uh, a very quick quick answer that would would be that yeah I think I'm very uh, happy that that there is a, a, a small awakening go going on in 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 the world right now it's it's still very very small but it is rapid and and in in some quite traditional organizations political parties corporations you do have individuals who are waking up to these uh, perspective, perspectives and right. that awakening is, is, is going fast. But still, the inertia of the old system and the old thinking and the old lenses is also tremendous. So um, my big question is, will, will this marginal uh, awakening be quick enough to really overcome both the fear that, that is holding our societies in a quite a strong grip right now and is reducing our, our ability to act more consciously and also just the inertia of the old thinking and the old structures. So um, I'm both hopeful, but also optimistic. That right, John, so, John, no, but, but, but a follow-up question to, to both of you, because I was thinking, uh, thinking about that a, a lot recently. So, so the role of the media, basically, because you know, it's like, the, of course, they are producing and spouting their own narratives and they are mostly modernistic in their kind of way. And they are still so powerful and interly connected to, to politics and the market and economy. And, you know, uh, Chomsky wrote a, a very important book about that and Niklas Luhmann. So, so how, from, from your point of view, so how, how, would you, how, how would we deal with the media? Because I think that's a crucial aspect in, in overcoming that inertia uh, that you were talking about, because it's like, uh, I think th these institutions are so uh, contraproductive in a kind of sense and so giant, giantly big that it's, uh, you know, so, so what are we doing here? John, maybe you start with that. Well, <clears throat> I, I, I'm afraid that, uh, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you, Tom, um, but I'm afraid that the, the narrative will only change uh, or start to change, I think, when um, organizations like Simpol and others um, start, you know, get are supported enough so that we st to, can break through that glass ceiling. You know, I mean, in the UK, for example, we already have 100 members of parliament um, signed up to implement Simpol alongside other governments, which, which probably makes us, I don't know, the third largest party in parliament i mean we're not a party of course but 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 you know the, the media has never uh, has never interviewed me and i've never been on tv or anything you know so but i think that when when the media gets the message 
that there is a significant number of voters out there who are who are pushing elections one way or another to get politicians of both sides to support something like simple then they will you know the narrative will start changing because they're going to start seeing something poking through the the uh, the current uh, modernistic national um, frame um, so so um, but but it will take um, you know, and, and this, this is why I come back. I do think that even within those, those of us who are, who are sort of world centric and do see the world as we do, you know, more as we do and as we can tell from this conversation, we're still not focused enough that, that the real main point of our, our attention must, should be at, at the global level. Because without sorting out the problem there, everything else is is just going to to fail and and so and i think this is this is what john stewart in particular means by conscious evolution that we you know to to to, to consciously t um, invite humanity to go where evolution wants us to go we need concrete plans and they need to be supported by people not just talked about but actively supported because otherwise we will never break through the media uh, uh, echo chamber. Right. Seems to me. Now my, my take that on, on the media question would, would be that um, it's an unfortunate uh, spiral that, that we are in here between uh, uh, democracy, the market, uh, and, and media. And of course... Um, uh, media uh, is driven by profits and tying this back to our human instincts we, we we are starting to understand our human instincts and our reptilian and limbic uh, brains more and more for for good and for bad and i think that both media and politics has started to be able to hack our brains so um, uh, if we have a media that is, is only driven by profit, in, in today's world, that would mean that you are driven by clicks. And whatever we are clicking on is being, being served to us. And politicians being so, so dependent on the media to get their message through, this ends up with the fact that the, 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 the views that are creating the largest response in our limbic brains uh, are the, the news that are um, propagated. And, and that's where we have, uh, uh, again, Brexit and Trump and other populist uh, uh, movements. And it's very difficult to do anything uh, uh, about that. But I think we have to sort of start realizing that just relying on, on our instinct and allowing media and politics to hack our brains in this way um, ca cannot go on. And that this is really completely uh, hacking the system that the Enlightenment philosophers and the founding fathers of the U U.S. Constitution constitution had in mind when they put the present implementation of democracy in, in, in practice, they actually believe that the, the mind of a free person is, we are not able to hack that, th that our reason will reign. And, and that was the foundation of, uh, of, of modern democracy. And if we now know that that is not the case, and we are starting to see the political effects of uh, actually media and politicians uh, cracking the code of human reaction. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what to do to, to get out of that conundrum, but somehow we need to get out of that box. Yeah, I, I completely agree, Thomas. I mean, one, one way that, that I describe it is that as citizens, um, we, sort of putting it in, in sort of psychological terms, if you like, 
our politicians are in the parent position, they're in the parental position, and we citizens are still in the child position. And the media is sort of mediating between the two of us. And we, we still um, expect our politicians to solve our problems. And even, even you know, uh, the, the activists like Extinction Rebellion, the very act of protest is, a, is, is, is on the assumption that our parents have the power to implement a solution Absolutely. if only we protest loud enough and shout long enough and so on. But what I think we need to realize, and, and part of, part of the, what I describe in the book of this sort of, what I call this vicious circle of destructive global competition between governments to attract capital, is that governments are not in control. The parents are no longer the pilot. There's no pilot in the cockpit. And so, you know, this, 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 what you're talking about, about us becoming more conscious, we have to grow up. We children have to realize that we have to become the parents yeah. because yeah. our parents uh, are lost, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's a growing, it's, a, it's, an, it's taking responsibility um, uh, and realizing that the, 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 the pilot is not in the cockpit. You know, the politicians are not in the cockpit. They're not flying the plane. They're just sitting in first class along with the, the, the Davos crowd, you know. Uh, and we citizens have got to get in there to stabilize things uh, and bring back some, some semblance of, of balance and, and order. But that's uh, and, a and huge, again, huge yeah. Yeah, that's a huge thing. That it, that it might not even be enough that we reach the cockpit. I mean, the, 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 the system today uh, is not made for, for handling these global problems. So we, we need to get into the cockpit, but we also need to rebuild the plane <laughs> in, order to, land mean, it, in mean, order to land it safely. Yeah, what I mean by getting into the cockpit is actually implementing something like Simpol or some kind of global yeah. cooperative yeah. Uh, yeah. governance. But, but then what I'm, my point is that only citizens can do that. Yeah. Only yeah. we can do that. We can't expect the, the politicians to do it for us. But the title of my most recent book is The World We Create. Yeah. With a fine finger pointing at the we. I mean, we, yeah. we shouldn't forget that. I mean, the, there is nobody else there who, no, who, no, is, who is creating our future or taking responsibility for that. It, it, it is up to us. And, no, and, it, we, and we have more power to do that than we realize. Some Absolutely. of that power is individual power and individual agency that we all can enact tomorrow. But some of it, and perhaps the most important part of that, is the collective aspect of this we power. And as, as we have become during the last hundred years, more and more empowered to in various ways uh, act out and act on our individual agency, we have in the same way almost reduced our capacity for collective sense-making and collective action. And yeah, that, that's that been another different. consequence of neoliberalism in a yeah, sense. Is, yeah. So yeah. We, 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 need, we need to realize that no, there is nobody else in control. We are the ones, but it's not just I. There is an important we to that aspect as well. But I, yeah, that's right. However, I think that, you know, that we, has to coalesce around you know a fairly small number of global governance projects you know uh, not obviously not just one you know hopefully you know there's simple there's there are other there are one or two others as well but but i think you know that has to be they have to be the focus because otherwise i just feel you know you know that i, I sense that there is still a sort of postmodern hangover going on within the you know, a lot of these movements, you know, there are, uh, I mean, <laughs> I remember now the, the House of Lords meeting we were both at now. I can remember which one you're talking about. And so here we have yet another group, you know, yet another organization. And, and so I just see this sort of fragmentation of so many organizations and, and there seems to be no coherence. No, you know, there's no, no coalescing around in, and, 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 and very little recognition that the global level is what we have to be focused on. Do you think that technology might save us here? I mean, that when we implemented uh, uh, democracy a couple of hundred years ago, there was no other way than 
us locally selecting one representative and putting that person on horseback and sending him to London. Um, now, we do not only have global communication systems, we also have more and more intelligent communication systems. We have artificial intelligence, we have blockchain technology and things like that, that combined with self-organization. Do you think we can, in 10 or 20 years, more rely on technology to get this coherence that you're talking about, co coordinating this, uh, these decisions that we might be not able to coordinate by just sending emails or huge meetings in, in rooms? Oh yeah, de definitely. I mean, I do think as a, as a general principle, um, I would say, you know, technology can, can be used for good or ill. Any technology you can use for, for good or ill. And therefore, we, still, we will still need some form of global cooperative governance. However, I agree with you that that, that level of governance could, could harness um, some of these uh, uh, um, decision-making software systems, for example. I mean, I've been approached over the years, Thomas, by um, about four or five different companies that are, that are producing decision-making software. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I've said to them, you know, yes, I'm very interested, but, but, but that won't really come into Simple until a much later stage in the game. At the moment. Might be that, the, that we should ask the system to make the de decisions and perhaps these systems are not designed to make the system make the decisions but at least they could help us gather revel relevant input and information from many millions of people and levels and then oh, yeah. aggregate something for for a human decision yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, one of, one of the problems I always see with them is they, again, they are, they are, <laughs> yeah, I suppose you could call them nation-centric in the sense that they don't, you know, these software systems, I think for, for those, for, for, for those um, decision-making software systems to work, you, you have to have a, a means for screening out um, policies or ideas that could be implemented within the nation state because the, the, we already have a system for that and it's called national democracy. Uh, and so you have to sift, you know, this is the subsidiarity thing. Those systems need to first sift out any national or lower level issue so that we are left just with the issues that no nation can deal with alone. That's what I'd be really interested in the seminal. And then you could really, you know, as you say, harness the, the, those kind of AI systems you know, within all of that to, to, um, to get to much better outcomes, I think. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I have Next another question. Um, uh, I have another question um, that might be a leading question um, or even a provocative question. But the point is, like, I, I try to make it more concrete, like we, we are facing a global crisis now with COVID. And um, so John, would you think that if, if something like simple would have been implemented by now, would, uh, would we deal differently with, with COVID? Because like I see, I see that especially like freelancers and small business owners are like kind of suffering way more than the book, big corporations who just like sweep in and get all the, you know, so, so would we deal differently when, 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 uh, with, with COVID and instead of just having like national lockdowns one after another, if we had no, some, a... if we had some. Well, I, 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 I certainly think, I mean, God, you know, I'm no expert on any of this, but, but I certainly think that um, <clears throat> if you had global cooperation, you would certainly have had much better preparation for a pandemic. So I could imagine that, you know, if you had global cooperation, you know, a lot of the money that is currently spent on arms would be redirected into healthcare and education. And one could imagine stockpiles of PPE, uh, you know, protective equipment being, and other things being kept in, in on different continents so that they could be distributed within 24 hours to wherever it was needed. Um, I think you would, I think, you know, there's been many good things about what has happened under the current system. I think the whole fact that there have been different vaccines 
developed by different groups, you know, working independently towards a, a, the same goal, has, has that diversity has been very good. Um, uh, but I think we would have been much better prepared. And I think also, more importantly, with, with global cooperation and proper taxation of, of, of the super rich and multinationals, um, we would, governments would be in a much better position to, for the economy to recover. Because at the moment, governments are strapped for cash, they're borrowed up to their eyeballs. Uh, God knows what the next 10 years are gonna, gonna bring, you know, with unemployment now and, 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 you know, the recovery is going to be tortuous because of the lack of, of global cooperation, to say nothing of all the problems, that, the global problems that are there anyway, you know. So I think, um, I think I think I think global cooperation is is necessary. Also, I mean, you're seeing, you know, there's a smash and grab for vaccines. So the rich countries are trying to hog, you know, as much of the vaccines as they can, which of course then leaves the poorer countries without adequate supplies. You know, so all of that could be much more fairly uh, organised. I think. Right. What's your take on that, Thomas? Hmm. No, uh, I'm, I think that uh, uh, any uh, coordination is, is better than uh, uh, no coordination. Uh, so, of, so, of course, uh, have, having a, a, a simple structure of coordination in, in place would have been much, much better. Then you still don't know how a system will react once it comes under extraordinary uh, stress. Uh, but but certainly it, it it would have been would have been better. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because a lot of people are afraid of the idea of global cooperation and coordination because they think it it implies this sort of monolithic, uniform, everybody does the same thing um, idea, which which is absolutely not true. Um, in fact, the opposite is the case. Is the more you know, I mean, if you, you, if you look at our bodies, for example, you know, we, we all have, the, all our cells have the same DNA, uh, unless, of course, if, you, if that's not the case, what you've got is cancer. Yeah. Um, and and, and that, that actually, that coordination allows um, for each part of our body to stay where it, it belongs, to be healthy where it belongs. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you know, and, and if you imagine that we didn't have that coordination in our bodies, uh, the heart would be waking up each morning saying, right, the price of blood this morning is so much. Uh, and, 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 <laughs> you know, and the cells, the cells that couldn't afford to pay would start, to migrating, would start migrating up to the heart. You know, this, and you can, you can already imagine, it sounds a little bit like globalization today. You know? um, but that's, that's also why I'm interest, so interested in this concept that we mentioned before about self-organization. So the, the question is, I mean, global organization, could the global organization be a global self-organization? And, and just as you say that the, the, the cells in our body, they, they cannot just look after themselves. They, they have some sort of self-organization in the body, but they all keep the, 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 to the totality of keeping the body alive and fit uh, as the overarching aim. And the same would be for a global self-organization, that we would have many individuals, units, regions, and every, uh, and every different levels self-organizing, but around the common goal of keeping uh, uh, the, the globe intact and the survival, the survival, not only the survival, the, the flourishing of yeah. humanity yeah. as the overarching principle of this self organization okay so yeah, that, that you have to explain because according to say Niklas Luhmann or Maturana or those those people you know the nervous system or the social systems are already working in a self-organizing autopoetic way it's like the way yeah. social systems and the media and politics and market is already working and has always worked so, so what do you mean by that specifically well if you take the example of, of a um, uh, corporation, and many corporations today realize that in this rapidly uh, moving environment and international competition, 
you can't any longer run a corporation with the old hierarchical model that information is, is picked up at uh, the lower level and then it's aggregated up in the hierarchy and then you have a management committee who takes the decisions, makes a three-year plan or at least a one-year plan and then you send it out. You can't do that any longer in a rapidly moving organization. So you try to implement self-organization, meaning that each and every individual in the organization, but also each and every individual department takes its own decisions. But for that to work, two things at least are required. One is that each and every unit in this organization not only looks after itself, but also looks after the totality and, and keeps in mind that the totality needs to be healthy. So that's the first thing, that you need to have that as an aim. The second is that you actually have the capacity to do that. And then as, as an individual in an organization, that, ha that entails a much, much more heavy cognitive and emotional load on you, not just optimizing your department, but also keeping in mind the totality. And, and, and that is a task that many organizations find is above the head of most employees today. So even if you have the intention and, and implement these structures, these at attempts break down because of the lack of capacity within the individuals. So that's why it's so important to develop these inner capacities, back to personal development and consciousness development, developing these inner capacities to be able to function in that sense. So then if you look, if you would then take this as an, this example to, to the politics and to the global level, okay, this would require that every individual in in his or her decision, but also every municipality and every nation state at the same time as, as they are optimizing their own well-being would also be required to keep in mind the well-being of the totality of the planet, of the ecosystem, but also the flourishing of all individuals. And, and again, this is today a completely utopian uh, fantasy, I would say. We, we don't have the capacities as individuals to be able to act on, 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 on this level of complexity. My question is, could it be possible for us w with our beautifully flexible capacity of our mind and our brain to evolve through our lifetime those capacities that we can do that? I say we can try. We, we can go in that direction, but I also think that we would need to have support from technology, information system support that would help us to get all the relevant information, get all the relevant data for us to be able to take these decisions. And I don't think that these decision systems or artificial intelligence should take those decisions for us, but they could help to inform, help to inform and coordinate and tell me about the decisions and everything that's going on elsewhere in, in the world and guide me in those yeah. important Yeah, things. I mean, I, you know, I, I would, <laughs> without wanting to sound too overblown, I would say that Simpol is a framework for exactly that, mm. uh, Thomas. Um, although I would say that, you know, on the, the aspect of the point you made that, 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 you know, you're talking about ordinary employees maybe not having the cognitive capacity, I mean, we are finding that too, um, that, you know, when, when I originally started the whole thing about 20 years ago, my, my, uh, my idea was very linear, that first we would get citizens um, and they would understand it, and then that would go to NGOs and politicians and up to government. You know, but what, what we discovered is that actually citizens are very slow to understand uh, destructive global competition and the need for global, and all of that stuff. However, the politicians we find are much more able to understand it because they're, they're, they're living that dilemma every day. How do we keep our country competitive and also solve climate change? You know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, a dilemma. So we find that uh, I d it won't be completely self-organizing, I, I would say from the bottom, but I think it, it, it simple comes in at, at all levels. So it comes in at, at the level of individual members of parliament, 
political parties, governments. Uh, and I think that the, the, if that process gets rolling, then I think citizens will catch up. Mm. You know, they'll, they'll be encouraged um, to see that, ah, oh, there's something going on that is driven by citizens, not an, an, or, you know, not by, not by governments. Mm. Uh, and then they might be encouraged to learn more about it and, and catch up quick. Mm. You know? but, but I, so you need a bit of both, I think. I don't think it's going to come just from pure self-organization. There has to be a bit of, it has to be led, I think, by an integral metamodern elite, if you like, you know. Uh, or, 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 and or, you always need the people who, who serve as the advent guard and, and, and yeah. leads the way. I, I certainly believe that. But I also am also curious about the possibility of using technology to scaffold these oh, kinds yeah. of yeah. Uh, decision processes. And we, we oh, should yeah. remember that today we are focusing so much efforts on uh, technology uh, learning through algorithms how to hack our brains for, for the purpose of manipulation in different ways, political Profit. or economic. Yeah. If, if we would put some of that effort instead of hacking our brains, asking how can we support and scaffold our brains so that we can function better as individuals, both taking the better decisions for ourselves, but also taking better decisions for, for the totality. Uh, yeah. that, that would be interesting to see. And I yeah, think that absolutely. a lot could be achieved already at the technological and artificial intelligence and deep learning level that we have today. And we will have completely a completely different level of possibilities in five or 10 years. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things, one of the areas I think technology could be really helpful would be in modeling, in modeling the effect of policies globally. So, you know, if you, if you said, well, if, if nation A increased taxes on emissions or yeah. on some bad thing by, by, by 20%, what would the effect be on 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 all other uh, you know on, on all other nations and and then what 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 percentage could they all implement that would actually produce the outcome that everybody wants yeah you know there, there would be you know they, they, i mean if they can model the the global weather system surely they can they can compute you know we can use technology to model things like that mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. you know so i completely agree tom I, thomas it, it, there's huge potential there I mean, I think it all also needs a vision, you know, because right. when, I, when I look at our landscape, we're, we're trying to stay away from something and deal with, with the world we're living in. But I, I, I love this concept from, from this beautiful thinker, Buckminster Fuller. He talks about this critical path, you know, where a vision incites the, the fantasy in the hearts of minds of like everybody. And so everybody, he uses the example of, of the NASA project, like uh, bringing people to, 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 to the moon. And so they were like, hundred thousands of people who are like doing their particular work and, and, and stuff, but also had the great idea in mind. And so if you would ask a, you know, a janitor, like, what's your job? You're a janitor. No, no, no. I'm bringing, I'm bringing somebody to the moon. And so there's like a big vision that incites yeah. like everybody and like, to, to move in a certain direction, and like with the help of, I don't know how many people, actually 100,000 people, they put a man on the moon. And so I, sometimes mm -hmm. I feel what lacks is also like a clear vision and somebody who, who, who proposes that kind of vision where we actually want to go. You know, it's like in terms of, you know, our next evolutionary step and, you know, and what kind of society we could live in. That's my point. We need a plan. Yeah, and I think simple is a, is a, is, is a good vision there because I think, again, with this rapid technological development, it's very difficult to have a concrete vision of where the world will be in 50 years, even 20 years. But if we can't articulate uh, a desirable end state with some certainty, if we can't do that, then we, we, then we can't just give up on the future and say, okay, let, let just the market and the present democracy take us wherever. No, we, then if, if we can't argue for a 
end state where we want to reach, then the focus needs to shift on the process. So what is our vision of a good process that could take us in the right, right direction? And I think it's simple, is a vision of a process that could take us in, in that direction. And, yeah, and of course- Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I mean it is a, there, is a, there is an end state, I suppose, in the sense that you could say the end state is, is, is practical global cooperation. Um, but but there is a, it needs that process and, and and that's absolutely absolutely right yeah but I mean I wouldn't you know I, I think that that you know I I'd say it's not you know simple is one possible vision and process and end state but there that you know there there need to be others and, mm -hmm. and people need to be looking at them I think there needs to be more attention on on those. Because I think the, the real problem again with the, with the nation centrism is is you know people kind of oh, global cooperation yeah you know that sounds nice but yet yeah, it'll never happen mm -hmm. you know then they, they, they dismiss it even before they've really thought about it let alone listened or looked into any particular vision or plan or process you know so there's a long way to go I think. All right. I think I think we had just 90 minutes, more or less. Yeah. Thank you both for coming to this podcast, John and Thomas. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much. It was a pleasure. My pleasure too.